Do you know, you get so many interesting um, phone calls into newsrooms. You Not do? as many anymore, maybe, because, you know, people ring mobiles, but... No, they, they send in Facebook messages now. That's You get all them. Yeah. Well, I used to, ha- I used to have these conversations with this elderly woman, and I won't say who she is, but she knew Brian Rattigan, and she used to ring me kind of like, you know, once every couple of weeks for a chat, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, and he was in jail at the time, and there was a lot of reporting around the Kremlin Drimna feud, which we'll go into yeah. as we talk about him. But uh, she was basically ringing just to tell me that he was actually really decent, Brian Rattigan, yeah. and he just had slight anger issues. Right, which well, <laughs> he definitely did. I mean, it was, was kind of like the most understated like you know that he had slight anger issues and she was basically saying that if he could get his anger under control he'd be a grand fella like a grand fella kind of thing you know yeah yeah. well she might have a point in in some ways because he obviously did have a certain charisma and certain qualities because really he spent all of his adult life in jail Mm. and mostly when those if you look at people other gangland criminals like Brian Mean or whatever they get washed up because they're out off the scene. But Brian Radigan obviously did have some charisma to keep himself going. I don't know. I think you'd call it determination to keep the money coming in because, of course, he ran, ran his drugs empire and ran drugs into the prisons. Yes. To make money. Yeah. And managed to stay. Which, But it is quite a rare thing to stay at, sort of at the top of a criminal organisation when you're off the streets for that long. It's an incredible thing. And that's why I thought we'd do a proper podcast on him because you know while he's sort of the realms of that kind of Crumlin Drimna feud which were sort of street fighters nearly um, I think he's a very interesting character and I think he has emerged and developed as somebody you know he's only out of jail and he's been spoken about as kind of one to watch as somebody who has cozied up alongside the family in Ballyfermot um, and somebody who's back in the game, literally within weeks of being out of prison. Yeah, back in the game in a in a in a serious way in terms of what's going on in the streets of Dublin. I think mm. you know if you compare them to obviously the the Kinnahans or whatever that are operating on this multi million euro level across the world, but like Brian Radigan has emerged as a significant player and on what's happening in in the drugs trade on a, on a street level in Dublin. And across the, the the country as well, and yeah, he, he there is a vacuum, and people like Brian Radigan have a yeah. have had a net. They have a network out there, um, of of people who are willing to sell drugs, take orders, and carry out what he's what he wants. Mm. And like, you know, amazingly for a guy who spent so much time in prison, he's only forty two. Yeah. Yeah. Like he, he, you know what I mean? He could have a long way to go if he keeps his, if he keeps himself out of feuds. But you should, you know, that actually gives us a good way into Brian Rattigan and yeah. where it all began from. Because you mentioned there, you know, there's a vacuum. Of yeah. course, the Kinahan mob have been taken out. And there is this jostling now at the moment. It's going to take a couple of years, I think, to settle down. You know, you have significant players there, like the family from the Ballyfermot area, like the Mr. Big Network, other smaller groupings um, in Dublin and I think you said the other day you believe that you know some of the what we call rural is some of the bigger cities outside Dublin that there will be a rise and and, you know more power given to those gangs perhaps or more for them to take absolutely I mean there there are there are established criminal networks in this Mm. country and if you think back to before really the Hutch Kinnahan feud I mean, the Kinnahans controlled absolutely everything that happened in this country. I mean, it was, they were absolutely, had an iron ruling over everything that went in. Mm. And even though there were other importers and all of that, they all eventually had to deal with the Kinnahans one way or another. And really what, what, what I was told before was that they would say to the major suppliers in Europe, you, ha- you have to deal with us. Mm. You're not allowed to deal with any other Irish gangs. And that that really... So even even the family and people like that, ultimately they were, at times at least, dealing with them. But that's gone now. And yeah. the Kinnahan, some of the, the people at the top of the Kinnahan network may well be involved in still getting drugs into the country, but they do not have that, that control of no. what's happening on the streets. So, yeah, and it's going to be possibly volatile times in certain communities where younger groupings try to take a hold but 
that vacuum was there before. And, yeah. and, you know, this is where Brian Rattigan was kind of like a young teenager, of course, in the Crumlin yeah. area. Um, so we go back to the, you know, the end of the last century, of course. Yeah. And you have this group of teenagers based in the Crumlin area. They're 14, 15, 16 years of age. They're hungry. Yeah. They want to get in on the game, the drugs game. They have come from an area where they've watched the likes of Martin, the general Cahill yep. and others kind of like become criminal godfathers. And they, they've had them as this sort of role models almost. Yeah, I mean, they had they had sort of celebrity gangster role models out there, yeah. didn't they? Um, you know, they, they and they were close to these guys and they also had family connections. Maybe not so much Brian Radigan, but some of the other guys, obviously, like Liam Byrne and people like that who and Freddie Thompson, they they knew people who were within their families who knew these people. But but really, again, like we said before, these were teenagers who grew up in the era of, of Dublin's rave scene, you know, where, where the drugs trade before was really, uh, you know, a very small part of, 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 of gangland even. But all of a sudden, there was huge amounts of money to be mm. made selling ecstasy and then ultimately into cocaine. And these were the guys who were on the on the on the streets and managed to take part of it. And Brian Radigan, um, along with Declan Gavin, uh, along with Freddie Thompson, and along with Liam Byrne, and Graham Whelan and a few others, they were the people, the the young guns who 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 hit the boom time. Yeah, because they were kind of like they were a group of friends as such. I mean, you know, there was what held them together really was that they were kind of young dealers, a young gang. And of course, in 1994, when Cahill was murdered, John Gilligan quickly came on the scene. I mean, he rose between 94 and 96 to create for himself a cannabis empire worth estimated 20 million pounds back then. Yeah. Um, you know, huge. And he, he needed young people. He saw the turf that was Crumlin Drimna. He saw how lucrative it was going to be and he wanted these young guys to handle his drugs from. And he sort of recruited Rattigan and Gavin and others. And actually what he did was when they were only 15 and 16, he allowed them go and meet his wholesalers in Amsterdam. So, I mean, they literally had a baptism of fire into the drugs game. And of course, 96, what happens? He decides that he wants Veronica Guerin murdered. His gang go on to kill her. And all hell breaks loose for the criminal underworld. The Criminal Assets Bureau are formed. Gilligan and his mob flee the country, go to the UK. He's eventually brought back, extradited back, put before the Special Criminal Court. And it's all over for him yeah. in such a short space of time. And he becomes as well, like the guard of resources were really very, very focused on John Gilligan at that point, you know? Yeah. Like that, that there, there's only so much the state has resources to police in a way, you know? Just like now the Kinnahans are have become the huge focus of the Gardaí and it does leave a, a, a gap there for these younger guys to start But I mean they were emerge. so young and I, I mean you're talking back at the you know the end of the last century was it feasible or believable that teenagers of that age were going to become a massive big mob and were going to become what they did so early in their careers you know I think probably it was the idea that Rattigan and, and Declan Gavin in particular had gone out to Amsterdam and dealt with the wholesalers they knew who they were yeah. and they knew exactly what to do the minute Gilligan was taken down they just moved into that vacuum yeah. and very very quickly were making a phenomenal amount of money for young teens yeah. and of course it, it happened that their, their, their rise coincided with a time when people all of a sudden were wealthier in Ireland like you know we're unfortunately old enough to remember the 90s and people at the start of the 90s like money was just tighter in general and by the time you hit 2000 there was money swirling around the country mm. and that some of that money swirled absolutely into the un the criminal underworld and mm. they were they were there to take to take charge of it you know so people who were sort of policing the area at the time would say that by the time he was like still only 19, Rattigan had kind of become a wholesaler. He yeah. had become John Gilligan by yeah. that age and was very ambitious. And along with Gavin, they were the kind of the two bosses of this grouping. And you had obviously Freddie Thompson there who was very pally with Gavin, who didn't really particularly like Rattigan. There was rivalry, yeah. I think, between Gavin and Rattigan about who was boss. 
Um, and then in, I think the new year, was it of 99 going into 2000? Yeah. Or was it 2000 going into 2001, the Holiday Inn? Well, 2001, I 2000, think, was yeah. it? Yeah. So the Holiday Inn. So at that point, they uh, they had brought in 1.7 million euro worth of cocaine yeah and that was between between gavin and rashkin they had sort of joined their their finances to bring that much in yeah and in the holiday inn in dublin was philip griffiths yeah graham the wig Whelan, and declan, declan gavin. gavin and they spent a 24-hour period cutting this cocaine you know down into street deals and um, they had hired i think two rooms in the hotel but unknowns to them, they were under surveillance. Yeah. And at some point during the night, the guardie burst in. They found Philip Griffiths and the wig Whelan with yeah. their literally their hands on the drugs. Yeah. But Gavin had gone for a lie down yeah. to another room in the hotel and he was nowhere near. He wasn't uh, sort of he was arrested, I think, but released without charge. And this created yeah. what became the Crumlin Drum feud. Yeah. And like if you if you think back to the time I think prosecutions where people were kind of members of a criminal organisation or whatever they didn't exist mm. so really like people had to be caught red handed didn't they back in the day to they be did, done yeah, for hands drugs on, yeah. like they had to be caught red handed mm. I mean John Gilligan obviously would ultimately be done on a kind of a a broader charge of, 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 of drugs charge but mostly if you weren't in the room with the drugs you were probably going to walk um, but obviously Declan Gavin walked away ultimately mm. and that sparked uh, an absolutely vicious feud really of these young guys who, who some of whom believe, believed he was an informer and that's how he Because of course away. coincidence or luck doesn't yeah. come into it in and that paranoid world and no. I think Rattigan immediately blamed Gavin of yeah. being an informant I think and on ratting on them and on this yeah. this uh, consignment, which was massive at the time. And really. which, of course, we don't fully, he can never know, but he really probably wasn't an informer. I think he can pretty much say that. Like, Well, he know? turned around then, of course, and he blamed Rattigan yeah. on also being an informant. So the two of them actually, well, they had this sort of, you know, business-like arrangement between them, but never really, they were sort of two alpha males, I yeah. think, and they didn't really get on. They then went to war and they, the, 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 big gr- the bigger grouping lined up behind yeah. them. And Freddie Thompson, of course, went with Declan Gavin. There was Paddy Doyle, the Burns. Yeah. And then with Rattigan, others, you know, went in behind him. Yeah, he had a, a network, uh, his own network, um, you know, who, 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 who backed him fully. It's amazing, really, when you think back to it, that you're talking about 2001 and a lot of those names that 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 were involved in that that year are still we're still writing about them they're yeah. still prominent i mean lean burn david Byrne was there when declan gavin was ultimately killed you know freddie thompson all of these people you know we're still they're still they're the ultimate brat pack they're the ultimate brat pack yeah, i suppose yeah. Um, so it was in August 2001 actually so that was the new year of 2000 going into 2001 that that yep. seizure was made in the August of 2001 Brian Rashkin who was from the Cooley Road in Drimna um, was at home at a party because it was his brother his beloved younger brother Joey was 18 and they were having a big do for him in the house yeah. and the same night Gavin went into town uh, to party Temple Bar was kind of their yep. stomping ground at the time he was seen as a ladies man both of them were full of coke because yep. of course they were all using their own product um, Gavin came back out to Crumlin after the night out in town ended and the only place open was the Abracababra chipper yep. um, at the same time some people who were at Joey Rattigan's party spotted him and went back and mentioned it yep. and Rattigan was you know, we talk about this uh, female that used to phone me to say that he had anger issues, slight anger issues. He had no control no. over his emotions at all and full of coke, drink and whatever else. Knowing that Gavin was up at the, the Abracababa chipper, he decided he was going to go up there and settle their differences once and for all. Yeah. Um, I mean, witnesses who saw it said he arrived in the back of a car, some sort of a somebody dropped him up to the chipper that he was almost salivating as yeah. he got out of the chipper yeah. and Gavin was inside having his takeaway and yeah I mean there was no planning there was no uh, gun 
didn't get his hands on a gun no. to do it or anything like that. No, it must be actually really unusual for a gangland murder to happen with a knife. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. So it was a spur of the moment uh, thing. He collected a sort of a, I think it was described as a bayonet at the time. It was certainly a big, long, a big mm. sort of hunting knife type of thing and confronted him. And he was viciously stabbed to death, Declan Gavin. Um, ultimately, there was eventually seen pictures emerged and you just saw blood splattered everywhere. Yeah. I mean, it was a horrific scene. And, you know, you always think it's kind of uh, to, to shoot somebody from a distance is, is, you know, must be a hard thing to do, if you know yeah. what I mean. But to actually stab somebody that violently and yeah. repeatedly. Um, and publicly, because there was loads of people there and loads of people saw it. And uh, I remember at one point, you know, the name wouldn't have meant anything to me at the time, but Anita Freeman was one of the yeah. witnesses. And Anita Freeman, of course, um, went on to be the long term partner of Sean McGovern, who's yeah. currently wanted in relation to the murder of Noel Duckhead Kerwin, a man who was named during the U.S., sanctions against the Kinahan organisation who went on to become Daniel Kinahan's right hand yeah. man. That's a whole other story. Yeah, and of course David Byrne was there who would yeah. eventually be murdered in the Regency and mm. which were, you know, in the middle of the the trial for his murder still. So Yeah, so it was it was a seminal moment and in a way it was probably, you know, a similar moment to that Regency moment when the gloves are off. This is full blown war. This is no longer sort of tit for tat threats this is it this is the beginning of what was to end up actually resulting in the the loss of 16 lives over the Crumlin Drimna feud so Rattigan did that went back to the party yeah um, and within hours of Declan Gavin's death I think Freddie Thompson had stepped forward as the new leader of the rival side yeah like Freddie Thompson was I mean Declan Gavin was probably a a more charismatic maybe a more uh, intelligent kind of thinking sort of Mm. gangland criminal but Freddie Thompson's rise really coincided with he was like a a wartime leader if you want Mm. Um, he was somebody who was willing to take the fight directly to the other side and um, you know that's how he, he he rose to prominence. That's how he took over from Declan Gavin in a way. And you know, funny, those who know him now uh, and only somebody the other day was describing his personality to me and saying that is what he thrives on. Yeah. Conflict. And you can see him in, in, in the prisons, like it's still that kind of conflict and yeah. that, that, you know, with the prison guards and all of that. There's, there's just a, a constant, uh, yeah, some people thrive in that. And like, wanting that sort of macabre celebrity that he has, that yeah. sort of weird, like, desire for for publicity and... Yeah, and like, you know, playing up to the cameras at times. Yeah. Um, and, of course, you know, ultimately he got overtaken by other people, like Liam Byrne and these were more focused on making money and, mm. and, and doing things. But at the time, Freddie Thompson rose up and he, he was the man to take the fight to the Radigan side. He he absolutely, you know, didn't waste any time when he took over as leader of that other s- side because six months after Gavin's murder, um, Brian Radigan, who has behaving very chaotically and again, mm. you know, showing that he wasn't in huge control of his emotions. He had heard one night that Freddie Thompson and a group of them were in a pub and he actually went past the pub and shot into it from a car, a bit like Wild West stuff. But that night, um, Thompson and his pal Paddy Doyle, who would later be murdered in Spain, um, they broke into Rattigan's home where he was asleep, conked out on drink and drugs in bed beside his uh, partner, Natasha McEnroe, and they burst in a balaclavas and uh, proceeded to shoot him five times. Yeah, they shot him with a, a shotgun, as far as I remember, and it, it, you know, it was a more sort of maybe a less lethal weapon than than mm. if it had been a handgun. A Paddy Doyle was a another interesting character. Then a big man, about six foot four, six foot five, from the north inner city, um, not not from the Crumlin Drimna area, but had ties into Freddie Thompson through through other relationships that are. People are not involved in crime in any way. Uh, Paddy Doyle would have been a childhood friend of Gary Hutch. So all of these ties were building. That That's how Gary Hutch was tied into mm. that that whole scene. 
Paddy and Doyle, of course, is a hitman for hire. Doyle was a hitman for hire. I think fair to say the most feared man in Dublin in his day. Funnily enough, other people have said to me who knew him that he would, could be a very sort of quiet and mild and sort of a really kind of nice guy. But he obviously, no, undoubtedly had that other side to him. Mm. Um, he was certainly very, very feared by the Radigan side. You know, he was, Paddy Doyle was a, a, a talented uh, tradesman, you know, but he, yeah, pe- somebody else described to me about walking down the street with him and, and you know, he was constantly looking over his shoulder and, you know, these, these people were really, really living on the edge at that point. What a life to choose, yeah. like, when you think about yeah. it, you know, as but, young, young. But they were going around in fancy cars with yeah. absolutely endless amounts of money and that, that, that was the attraction. Um, it was and they were staying at the time they were moving from hotel rooms to hotel rooms and there was always women and there was you know the usual designer clothes and everything and that they had kind of they they, they felt like a kind of a this generation who had chosen to go to war but like you know it was a cocaine war and that's what it was later to, called you know there was loads of money and backing there but um, it was a, it was a life you'd wonder you know, many of them, if they look back now in their 40s at it, would they regret? I don't know, because you must, uh, like, somebody uh, I remember as well describing to me as, like, living a permanent uh, panic attack. Yeah. That that's what, it was lo- that's what it was like. Yeah. That you were just going around with that constant sense of panic. Yeah. Well, you would be. And yeah. then, of course, they were throwing cocaine in on top of that and yeah. whatever else, you know, didn't help. Um, steroids and anything else that they were taking. So Rattigan was injured. He survived and, and Natasha McEnroe did, his girlfriend did see the attack. I think Rattigan awoke and ran into a bathroom or she ran into the bathroom and hid and he was shot. He survived, had to be fitted with a colostomy bag. Um, but nonetheless, he was down but not out. Um, and in the meantime, he uh, Freddie Thompson set his sights on his younger brother, Joey, his beloved younger brother. And uh, sometime later, he was shot dead after yeah. being lured to his death. Like Joey Rattigan, um, obviously was a sort of a associating with Brian Rattigan and those gangland criminals that were in his mix. But nobody, I think, would describe him as, as a sort of a feared or dangerous criminal. He really, uh, he may have been up to a certain amount of stuff but he wasn't uh, he was only 18 he was only 18 and Mm. he wasn't of the temperament of his of his Mm. older brother Brian and so he became uh, an easy target really and that's what happens as these feuds start to escalate and you see that from memory it was somebody that Rattigan the Rattigans would have thought was a friend a Paul Warren guy or somebody Mm. who rang him and asked him to come for a pint and he went out for the night drinking and then it was when he was walking home that this gunman kind of came out of the shadows on Cooley Road and shot him dead and Brian Rattigan of course went absolutely ballistic yeah I think it was one of those murders that it became a kind of unforgivable thing in 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 gangland terms because it always does uh, you know like he was a soft target mm. you know he wasn't somebody Joey Rattigan wasn't ordering murders or ordering shootings on the other side And well it was the first time probably that um, you know those sort of older rules of gangland were parked and, yeah. and they went after the families Yeah, and like we've seen that repeatedly now in the Kinnah and Hutch feud but that is really the first clear example of that where they can't they couldn't get Brian Rattigan, so yeah. they went for the, the the brother who they knew was going to. And of course, that anger. And I mean, we're not going to go through every murder of no. the Crumlin Drimna feud here, but that significant murder must stay with Brian Rattigan. And whether or not he has gone through courses in prison in how to, you know, control your yeah. feelings, like a brother yeah. being killed like that. Well, I mean, and he has him tattooed. Down yeah. his whole body, his and brother. and for I mean I I don't know if he did it in recent years, but I think up until very recently he put a he would write him a poem and put it in the paper every mm. every year on the anniversary of his death. Brian Radigan would even from Portlaoise Prison, you know he in, in yeah. tribute to his brother, mm. you know. So, like it, it was, it's extraordinary. Now what went on after that? As I said, we won't go into every no. single murder of it, but Radigan was jailed ultimately for initially the murder 
of Declan Gavin and he was given a life sentence. He went to prison and Thompson looked like he'd sort of won the battle. Yeah. Um, certainly Rattigan was, had lost quite a number of his hitmen. Yeah. He lost quite a number of his key associates. Yeah. And he was in prison for life. You know, what more yeah. really could he do? Was It was seen and it was, it was as if Freddie Thompson was walking away with the trophy, you know. Big time. Um, of course, he went on into the the inner circle of the Kinahan organization and would have t- taken a very significant lead role again when the Kinahan Hutch feud broke out, having been blooded essentially by the, the Krim- yeah. Crumlin Drimna feud. So to focus more on Rattigan for this, Rattigan went to jail and there he sort of continued his drug racket. Yeah, I mean, it was he was ultimately given 17 years for running a drug a drug business from his from his prison cell i mean was one of the first cases of that a massive a massive sentence as well um but they had text messages uh showing that he was arranging deals you know they had collecting debts having debts collected all that kind of stuff so he this was that he was running his drug business on the outside of the prison, so he was continuing. He was doing whatever it by his mo- patch was. yeah, by mobile phone. Yeah, he was, and he was running, caught with that. He was caught with that and and ultimately convicted. Mm. And you know, it was it was a couple of million euros. I think it was one point one point one million or whatever. So it was a huge amount of money, and it was all by text message. Uh, you could see the the deals done. The scale of it was was big, if not if not monstrous, like like we mm. became used to, but still a really significant operation. You had people on the outside who were willing to collect debts, drop drugs to people, and um, he seemed to have made some contacts in prison. That that was a factor as well in it. Um, so it was, and a, he was in custody, of course, since two thousand and three, and the Crumlin Drimna feud continued really after that. So clearly he was still directing his side in it. Yeah, he's, he obviously retained that loyalty mm. of people on the outside who are willing to do business for him, basically. Um, he seems to have been slightly a separate kind of network to the to the core Kinahan organisation, which was really based around a lot of the Crumlin figures like Liam Byrne and Freddie Thompson. And he seems to have a sort of a separate network. Um, and he, we always heard and knew for a fact that there was guys as as the 2010s went on there was guys in their late teens early 20s who res- remained hugely loyal to Brian Rattigan mm. and they were dealing heroin dealing cocaine particularly in a couple of uh, inner city uh, flat complexes they had their own little territory and they were involved in outbreaks of violence with with the the Freddie Thompson side as mm. well but they were, uh, yeah, the, so that, that that was unusual. And obviously then, at the time, it looked like um, Brian Radigan would n- never see the light of day. Because if you look at, say, Brian Meehan, he's still in prison. Yeah. Um, that's, he was convicted maybe 10 years before Brian Radigan, and he remains in prison, uh, just in an open prison at this stage. But Brian Radigan was found guilty of murder, but that was ultimately overturned. And of course, he befriended in a big way John Gilligan, his old boss yeah uh, in prison and they became very very close I think behind bars until Gilligan's release Um, you know the suspicion is that they have kind of worked together in the drugs business yeah I mean I think, I think in together I think ultimately Brian Rattigan became the senior partner there and Gilligan became the lesser yeah. light and Brian Rattigan um, maybe gave him a degree of protection actually in, in the prison system because Obviously, prison uh, people are very segregated in different units, and we see that it more and more. But Brian Radigan was in Port Leash, which is the original high security state prison in the state. I think mm. it's described as the only high security prison in the state. And over time, he became maybe the top the top figure in that prison. Um, and do you think that's because of the length of time he was in, or is it his, you know? Personality and I, kind of status in, in the criminal a, underworld. I'd say it's a few things, but it's also the fact that he did have people on the outside. Yeah. So people rise to the top in the prison system when they have people on the outside who are willing to do stuff for them. Maybe get drugs in, 
you know, collect things outside, you know, make things happen on the outside. And Brian Rattigan retained that, and that gave him a certain degree of power. Um, you know, he 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 was also there a long time. He had, like, if you remember, he had a really really tight connection with the Keen Colopy gang in Limerick as well. Still does, and still does. Mm-hmm. And and that was that was a you know they were there were members of the Keen family found up with the staying in the Rattigans, and similarly, there was members of the Rattigan crew caught down in Limerick and going to the pubs with the Keens and Colopy. So it was very, very, mm. a, a, like a very, very strong alliances. So we had these alliances across the city or across the country, you know. And of course, what we believe is that he was running the drugs into the prison system. He, yeah. was, he was the man, the main man for that. That makes him very useful, very powerful and pretty rich because drugs are worth a lot of money in prison. Now, look, Port Leash is the highest security prison in the country it's not good if a mobile phone is found in there but it does like every prison drugs do seem to find their way well, in well drugs and mobile phones are mm. like they get in you know they do they do get in um, in 2017 the murder conviction relating to the Declan Gavin stabbing was overturned and uh, Rattigan was Recharged or pleaded yeah. guilty to manslaughter, and he got a nine-year sentence, which at that point he'd served. Yeah. Um. So he just had to serve out the seventeen years he got for running the drug operation in prison, and he was to be freed. Yeah. Now, twenty seventeen was a time when the Kinnahan organization had imploded, when Freddie Thompson was yet again looking over his shoulder. Um, and was going to war on behalf of Daniel Kinahan in Dublin, was travelling in and out of the country, had had loads of history of falling out with various um, senior figures in organised crime and was a man kind of on the run, uh, or certainly a man that, you know, whose downfall seemed more inevitable. So it was kind of like as Rattigan prepared to step out of prison, it looked like, and indeed... Surely it happened that that yeah. uh, Freddie Thompson was ultimately convicted. Yeah, a strange of kind of narrative kind of started to grow up around Freddie Thompson, where the Kinnan we were told the Kinnans didn't like him and mm. thought he was like a bit of a Egypt really. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. People have said that the Kinnans thought Freddie Thompson was a thug. Yeah, so they didn't. You know, they used to get him to cut the lawn. Yeah, yeah. Which, which actually, I have heard that that's big. That's been disputed. That he used to. Freddie Thompson was ordered to cut the grass in in, in Daniel Kinnahan's uh, disputed villa. Disputed by him because yeah. it wouldn't have looked good. But you know, in other parts of the forest, you hear that that was one of the kind of the the ways that the Kinnahans showed their aloofness to others within the group. Yeah, kept him in his place. So. Freddie Thompson was, but but I think when the few kicked off, Freddie Thompson was put forward by the Kinnahans as a as a fixer for 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 you know the movement of weapons, mm. targets, all that that kind of stuff, um, and f- he would ultimately be convicted of murder, the murder of Dahi Douglas, which was regarded as a feud murder, but maybe a, a sort of a half solo operation by Freddie Thompson over a long standing grudge who sort of had him targeted as a result, Dahi Douglas. And so Freddie Thompson ultimately ended up in Port Leash Prison with the guy yeah. that he had gone to war with 20 years or less than 20 years before. Um, his arch rival. His arch rival. And, you know, OK, there's this story then and we'll tell it and then mm. we'll opinionate on it maybe, mm. but... Um, Thompson goes to Port Leash Prison and he doesn't want to be in isolation. He wants to be able to move around the landings and, you know, be kind of, you know, as free as you can be in a prison. Yeah. So he seeks, um, he, he appeals to Brian Rattigan, who then goes and writes a letter to the prison service saying they've no gripe between one another and he'll welcome and protect Freddie Thompson yeah. within the prison system. Yeah. And Freddie Thompson uh, enters the main prison system with Brian Rattigan as his protector. Yeah. So, okay, that happened, right? That happened. But uh, that actually happened. I mean, yeah. that actually happened. There's, there's, you know, court uh, evidence yeah, it was from read that. Out in court, it yeah. was read out in court. Uh, we're not just making that up. It did happen. Um, all is not as it seems with that. No. I mean, when Rattigan eventually is released, Freddie Thompson goes to a meeting with him and Rattigan tells him that he can no longer protect him when he's not in the prison anymore and he's sort of basically 
I mean, what's going to happen, Thompson, if he doesn't have protection in the prison? So he he ends up being moved out of the prison after Ratican leaves. But nonetheless, what do you think was going on there? And do you honestly think that a guy with the reputation of Ratigan and the propensity for violence, with his dead brother tattooed on the side of his body, the poems he writes from every year, that whole idea of a brother for a brother, an eye for an eye. Do you think Ratigan forgave Thompson and offered him protection? I don't know. I mean, forgiveness seems a, like if, if, if Prince Harry can't forgive William, for throwing on the dog bowl, can Brian Radigan forgive <laughs> <laughs> Bad Freddy? I don't know. I mean, it's it's unusual. I think there is a, a thing of getting one over on the prison authorities as well. That so they, they came may together have. to do that? Well, I think so. I think there must be, that must be a factor in it, you know, because Fra- Freddie Thompson has had a, an ongoing war with the prison authorities since he's yeah. since he's gone in. He's a so number mouthy. Of, a number of cases have gone in, a number of incidents, complaints not to get into them all. And I suppose uh, people like Brian Radigan and like Freddie Thompson, they both like getting one over an authority, you know? And mm. one of the reasons that Fat Freddy was, the prison service gave that Fat Freddy was being kept in solitary confinement was for his own protection. And by Brian Radigan giving this letter, mm-hmm. that took that away. But it's it's very unusual. But uh, Radigan has to be doing it for his own ends. Surely he has to be doing it so as he will be released when he's yes, ready to be released. Yes, and also like so he was not going to be held in any longer. I mean, there was lots of other things about him seeking uh, to get out. Brian Radigan about how he, you know, the court also heard how he was a changed man and he'd been involved in the Christmas panto in the prison. Do you remember that? Was I it do, yeah. the, was it the Wizard of Oz or something? I, I can't remember exactly. Ooh. I don't know if we can get sued for getting don't the wrong yeah, the I wrong musical. So. <laughs> but it was it was. And what was his role? I don't know. So mm. you know, he 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 made that known that he was a changed person, and and you know that probably facilitated him getting out of prison uh, slightly early, um, and so he's out. He's out and he got out of prison, went straight to Alicante, and I believe. Where, and as he came out, he was pictured coming out yeah. and you could see him wearing a locket with his brother's image, Joey, on it. OK. So, you know, he got out and um, he may have stayed around Dublin for a week or two, but quickly left. Um, mm. He certainly ended up in Alicante. He may have gone over to the UK for a period. What could first. you see in the picture? Was he co- totally he was covered? Wear, he totally covered with a... a yeah, his face mask. covered, but there was a, a locket with, yeah. with a picture of, of Because Joey apparently there. he had become very fit, very yeah. slim, had lost that kind of, you know, boxiness of his face, um, long hair, beard, yeah. bit of a Jesus look. Yeah. We wouldn't recognise him, I was told, if we saw him yeah. without the hat and the, the, the mask. I'm sure we probably would, but um, yeah, he's changed his image completely. Yeah. Um, and left and headed straight for Alicante, which is, of course, the seat, if you'll still call it the power of John Gilligan. It, but it's it's where John Gilligan's stomping yeah. ground is. And in the meantime, of course, John Gilligan had come out of, of prison a number of years earlier. He'd ended up in, in, in Alicante, as you said, off the beaten network, maybe, of the of the kind of really core of the drug importation business if mm. where the Kinnons are based and all the Mor- the Morocco Mafia and all these guys mm. in a less in a kind of a, a, a more um, a low brow version of mm. that in Alicante where they were he's, he's before the courts for this of course for basically sending drugs back from Spain in through the mail system yeah. Yeah. through the mailing system yeah. and you know you could look at it and think that's not the same as the Kinnons hiring container ships yeah but it does, from the evidence that's given in court, it's still a significant business. Mm-hmm. Um, he seems to have had people in the UK as well that were being serviced by, not just by uh, cannabis, but also by uh, sort of uh, prescription tablets. And while it doesn't sound as, as glamorous, as, impre- as impressive, it was still a, a, a very significant operation. Mm. And Brian Radigan seems to have ended up staying with him. There are suggestions that there some of those networks were 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 merged, or there was a there was a, an association with them, and at this point now, that's what we're hearing that that Brian Radigan is 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 
back in the he's business. Back in the business, back in the game. Yeah. And while he will be somebody who will be wary about re entering a feud as such, you know, because he's not going to survive again if he starts a feud, you know what I mean? No. And it's no way to live. I suppose he has the sensibility of having come of age in prison, of yeah. having matured in prison, which is a scary thing to think of that somebody as volatile, as dangerous as he was, as such a young man went into prison and matured there amongst, yes. you know, wha- who he was mixing with in Port but, Leash. But so you can think of, of that, but there's two really, really sinister incidents that have been associated with the Radigan gang. And mm. these aren't going back to history, back to 2001. Um, this is in, in recent times. There's two murders that are, mm. are you know, um, two that have been associated with Brian Radigan's gang. Let since his release? No, not since his release, but in recent years. So one of them is the murder of Philip Finnegan, which mm. is one of the more horrific murders in, in, in the history of Irish gangland. Philip Finnegan would have been an associate of, of, of some of the younger members of the Radigan gang, would have you know, been involved in a certain degree of stuff, but he seems to have gotten a dispute with Brian Rattigan's gang over a drugs debt and he was um, lured into the woods in County Kildare and violently stabbed to death and decapitated ultimately mm. by a man named Stephen Penrose, who was a very, very enlisted member of Brian Rattigan's gang. Um, Stephen Penrose is probably one of the most dangerous yeah. people in this co- in this country and is serving a sentence for that murder during that his murder trial there was evidence heard of how um some of this murder was allegedly organized from port leash prison and um, how it was tied to the brian brian radigan's criminal organization this is the same time that brian radigan was going through his transformation where he was becoming a drama loving uh, uh, mm, uh mm. changed man and then more recently uh the murder of uh, a guy called Gary Carey, um, that has been linked to the Brian to the to the Radigan gang as well. The Carey, Radigan of course, team. was shot in the car park of a Kilmainham hotel. Survived for two months before he died from his injuries. Uh, was targeted a number of times and, um, so, and wasn't of, wearing a bulletproof vest. This particular uh, Gary Carey time. was a very serious criminal yeah. himself. Had been very heavily involved in the drugs trade for a long time. Um, maybe gone a bit under the radar he would have you know but would have been a target for the criminal assets mm. bureau would have taken a good deal of of assets off him and um, he would have been associated with the family he would have been involved in that sort of business sometimes dealing with them sometimes dealing separately um so what's when he was shot dead what we have been told or what what is being said is that as he was as he, as you said it took him a couple of months to die but as he, after he'd been shot that he he blamed Brian Radigan verbally yeah um mm. to to the rescue services um and so that's only in recent times as yeah. well so the, the the family of course are 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 you know a Ballyfermot based gang who've be, probably become the the the, the biggest presence I think in the drugs trade in They're in certainly Dublin the number now. one target now of the Drugs and Organised Crime Bureau who you know are the you know the section of the Gardaí who are really policing and trying to keep a handle on who needs to be yeah. policed more than anybody else because they obviously can't police every gang but um, you know there certainly is a lot of Concern about Ratigan, maybe his links to the family or his friendship, or certainly he's he's keeping. Yeah, a so you see, see the way these things go, of course, and, and there's concern about Ratigan basically because he's probably one of the most dangerous and volatile criminals in the country. He's been released from jail. He has managed to continue his empire. Empire maybe is a bit of an exaggeration, but he's managed to keep, you know, a, a f- hand in the game throughout his time in prison. He has clearly made some serious connections in there and uh, has developed completely his personality and his maturity in the prison system and is now out and is. Yeah, just well, I mean, if you take those two, two those yeah. those are two murders there. I mean, and, you know, that shows you the, the, 
the dangerous level of that criminal organisation. And neither of those proper. murders would have sparked any retaliation. No. I mean, Gary Kerry was, you know, um, quite un, un, an unpopular figure, actually, in gangland. He was c- kind of notorious for uh, using extreme violence or for small drug deaths. Mm. And we actually had a story, of course, in, uh, in the Sunday world, ultimately, there were some guys... Uh, desecrated his grave even after he was gone. Uh, there was video footage of it. They took themselves. So he probably didn't have that that kind of uh, that network behind him. Mm. Um, the Philip Finnegan one, I think, is just a very very sad murder. But it just shows you that that even somebody that members of people that would have known him all his life, and even Stephen Penrose had been his friend, but you know. They were still willing to kill over over a, a debt unpaid. And the bigger question, I suppose, is will he try and avenge the murder of his brother? But, you know, if he did try to do that, would that be seen as, or if associates of his perhaps tried to do that, would it be seen as an attack on what's left of the Kinahan? Never, I don't know. Would it be I mean, too big a reach for him? Do you know what I mean? Well, would it, it, may, be it may well be. I a mean, big mistake. Remember... Freddie Thompson is is the first cousin of the of of Liam Byrne, um, he is you know a, a relation of uh, Bomber Kavanagh as a result. Um, Bomber Kavanagh is married to his aunt, so there, that was always uh, that's there, you know. Mm. Um, but Brian Radigan has there have been talk that he's been back in Ireland, um, but really he seems to be staying away. And that probably shows a certain ambition um, where, you know, yourself with criminals, there's a, some of them that can't leave Dublin mm. because they need to be the big shot walking around and, and, you know, have everybody know them. And you see the other guys who go away and try and keep a low profile, stay off social media, which Brian Radigan is doing, um, not get pictured, try and not get named. And they have a kind of an ambition to make money. Yeah. To, to get somewhere to take some control um, it's the guys that are floating around the flashy types who are floating around Dublin and joining TikTok and calling people rats yeah you'd have that to are think a different he's type. too old for that and um, you know that there will be a level of maturity that he has attained from his time in prison but at the same time there would also have been an awful lot of emotions and etc built up yeah. Over his time incarcerated, he's had a lot of time there to think about. Yeah, I mean, it's an incredible, if you think about it, from 2003 to, was it, 21? Yeah. I mean, it's all your adult life yeah. in the prison system, one mm. way or another. And he'd actually had other convictions in before 2003, I think, when he had spent some yeah. periods of time in, in jail as well. You know, it's a, it's a funny, funny life these people choose, I think. Mm. Um you know. Most definitely. But I mean, look, Brian Rattigan is one for us to watch and, you know, any um, developments in what he's up to, we'll certainly come back with. But yeah, he's a he's a character who is certainly one of the more interesting members of the criminal underworld and um, probably the more more volatile yeah. and more capable of doing anything or. Yeah, 